welcome back to the Cult of Domesticity this week. We're here with Brandon from Southern Gothic. Ooh. Hey, y'all. How's it going? Do you going? want to tell everybody about the Southern of the Gothic? The Southern <laughs> of the Gothic? Oh, man, I don't know what there is to tell. I just like to tell spooky stories. We do spooky stories from the South. We do we do some true crime history. We talk a little bit about ghosts, stuff like that. And, of course, anything that's in the South and anything that's a little creepy, we go there. So, yeah, that's Southern Gothic. I hope you guys take a listen. It's very yeah. spooky. It's a very good time. So we've already been talking for an hour and a half because we're both self-isolating hardcore. And, <laughs> you know... We haven't talked to people outside of our house, which you have a family. I live alone. So just been wandering around like people, people. I know. Outside contact is fantastic here. So and since I have a family, if anybody turns up their volume really loud, I bet you can hear my little ponies on in the background right now. I think it'll be. <laughs> While we talk about awful yeah, things, right? You know, if you feel bad, just put a picture of a my little pony and it'll be fine. I mean, unless you're picturing My Little Pony doing these things, and then never mind. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> so what are we talking about today, Gordon? We're going to talk about Buck Ruxton, and that's not his original name. He did change it, but it, I really couldn't find his actual name. Everybody just referred to him by this, probably because it's Eurocentric and imperialistic. Yeah, well, he was Indian, right? Yes. He's from India. This is, we got some Indian, we got some French, and we're going to hang out in Scotland. <laughs> we can be everywhere. Yeah. I mean, obviously, Buck Ruxton was simplified version of probably his born name, right? No, I think he picked it. He changed it. Oh, he did. Mm-hmm. So he was born in Bombay, India. That's Mumbai now. I it's that, I knew that off the top of my head. That's not in my notes. I just know this now. You see, you're going to teach me ge- or geography outside of America because I'm down here stuck in the South and I don't know anything outside of Mississippi. So <laughs> I mapped so much of India for the 18th century, which for the European documents is not a lot of mapping. So I had to learn a lot about Indian geography. March 21st, 1899. Bad with numbers, which actually just passed. Birthday just passed. Oh, wow. Perfect timing. Well, do, do you wish him happy birthday? Or do you? I would say no. He does, we'll he's not no. a great person. He's in the unofficial assholes of history category that I have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he'll hang out with Columbus and all of them. He was actually born to a middle-class, wealthy Parsi family of Indian French origin, so probably Indian traders, or French traders in India, you know, put two and two together, they make a family. (laughs) You know, he gets a good upbringing because middle-class. He's referred to as a sensitive youth, don't know what that means, but highly intelligent, and he got a very good education. So, he decided he was going to become a doctor, go into medicine. So that stereotype, guys, prevalent. Yeah, even at the, what is that? That's the beginning of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with the help of mommy and daddy, he studied at the University of Bombay, where he qualified as a Bachelor of Medicine in 1922. So we're, we're deep in the 20th century now. He then goes on to qualify as a Bachelor of Surgery, so a surgeon, at the same institute. So so University of Bombay. He decided... After that, he's going to get employment at the at a Bombay hospital. He specializes in medicine, midwifery, which love that term, and gynecology. <laughs> That's quite quite the plethora of different specializations. Huh? Well, midwifery and gynecology closer together, but just general surgery, medicine, yeah, and having yeah surgery. He then gets employed with the Indian Medical Service, which he gets deployed to Basar and later Baghdad. So he's traveling. And we know that he marries in May 1925 to a Parsi woman named, and I'm so sorry for this pronunciation, Mutabai Ganarahi Gerdari. And it's an arranged marriage. Very short lived, though. And he then takes financial assistance from his family and the Bombay Medical Service. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go to Britain. And he does this in 96. And at this point, remember, guys, India is still part of the British Empire. It is not a separate country. It is not a separate thing. That's not till the post-World War II when technically King, uh, Prince Philip's uncle, grandfather, member of his family messes up the separation. That's another story. So was he? So would he have been a British British citizen going there? From India, a, what, is that how that would work, or is or is it they're kind of separated as a different class because they're they're like a colony, so therefore, um, they're gonna be he's going to be treated differently just because he's Indian descent, anyways. But he is a um, citizen yeah. of the British Empire, so he does have right going there. He has free ability to travel, so it's not unusual for the like people to go there and study in England and come back. It's also oh. 
not uncommon for people to move there because to get work. Especially so it wasn't difficult for him to go there legally or anything. No. It was just a, some social distancing <laughs> while he's there. <laughs> oh, oh man yeah so i mean it's plenty of people did we see a big run i think in the 60s when they were kind of determining to cut off that connection a little bit more between britain and india and like their former colonies but at this point mm-hmm. it was pretty common because if i remember correctly i think gandhi might have studied in the uk as well like it's not cr- a crazy thought right. he when he moves to britain he conceals all evidence of his marriage through uh you know but he did contact his father-in-law in 1928 for money. So he got sent 200 So was his wife with no. him? No. Or did he, he left, he his, left wife his wife and then pretended to be a bachelor? Yeah. Huh, well. But still called his father-in-law for 200 pounds. <laughs> his Facebook status was, it's complicated. It's complicated. I'm single right. until I need 200 pounds. <laughs> What would 200 pounds have been? At that point... You have I, any idea? It's a good amount. Of, it's a good chunk of change. It's not like a small amount, but... Uh, like buy a house or buy a car? Um, I think we're still... If you're 19... 19 well, you know, that's right around 40s. So it's up... Cumulative price change is 4,000%. And the converted amount is... It's almost 9,000 pounds now. Mm, wow. I, I don't know who would send me 9,000. Like, not my parents. They would judge me. <laughs> They'd be like, why do you need $9,000? Like, $9,000 or pounds. And I'd be like, none of y'all business. <laughs> oh, I'll be buying microphones. I, I bought my own home studio, Mom. Come on. Let me live my life. <laughs> so, Ruxton then goes to attend medical courses at London's University College Hospital. Not under his own name, no. He was using the name Dr. Gabriel Hakim, but then he moves to Edinburgh from London in 1927, and he begins studying uh, for a fellowship of the Royal Colleges of Surgeons. So he's like, that's a, I mean, Edinburgh is known for their surgeons, like their university, Mm -hmm. top-notch surgeons, which is good. He failed his entrance exams. Not great, but they, I don't, right? Like, you're like, you're already a doctor. You practice yeah. as a doctor. How do you fail? Well, why? At the same time, he's changing his name and going for more. It, that doesn't, like, he's probably trying. You can't really build a career based on what you've already done if you just changed all your names, right? Yeah. Plus, I think maybe he's uh, trying to hide himself because he left his wife. So it's harder to find. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it would be easier at this time. It's harder. It's easier to forged documents and stuff like that so it's right. easier to hide but it seems like he's trying to get certified in the in the uk uh-huh. but luckily for him the general medical council authorized him to practice medicine because of his qualifications in bombay so his history actually did help him out they're like okay you clearly yeah. just did like didn't do well on the test but you have a ton of experience we see shortly after that he changes his name legally this time in a deed poll to buck ruxton so this is the first coming up of it yeah do you do you think of buck rogers when you hear this like all i can think about is how do you come up like i don't know i live in tennessee the name buck does not sound foreign in any way shape or form so probably not it doesn't sound foreign it may be uh, like i wonder it was that common at that point in time where he was at i think I mean, he doesn't look, he probably could have passed a little bit as white. So it might have been a way to help pass. And passing is an interesting phenomenon. If you guys don't know about it, it's basically you try like passing is another race for you. So if you were African American, sometimes if you looked white, it was easier to just claim you were white, but you also like couldn't acknowledge the other half of you. It's a big phenomenon. A lot of historians study like the concept of passing. It's really interesting and fascinating. So that's what it like the name kind of makes me think is he's trying to pass because I mean, yeah. obviously he's trying to change his identity entirely. Yeah, I mean, he could probably in the Indian British Indians have been in the UK since Britain has been involved in India because people can't keep things in their pants and then they have children. <laughs> and that's how that goes. They they're colonizing. They're, they're colonizing and imperializing. <laughs> so I don't think he looks. I mean, I think he could pass because he's French Indian. So yeah, yeah. So, 
I wonder what accents and all. Oh my god, the accents sound in that time period. Great, probably so much fun accents. Yeah. So during this time, he's studying. Um, while he was studying to become a fellow in Edinburgh, he became acquainted with a 26 year old woman named Isabella Van S, who worked in a cafe and managed it in the city of Edinburgh. So look at her moving up in the world. She technically was still legally married to a Dutchman who she had married in 1919. Which, if you think about it. Everyone's like, yay, World War One's over. Think about it. Everyone was real happy about that. That would have been a big deal. Yeah. Then, yeah, and so you'd be like, yes, I can finally marry you. And then you're like, oh, I did not want to marry you. It only, like, she had only really been married to him for a couple weeks. And then she returned to using her main name of her. So really kind of divorce via bye, bitch. <laughs> That's not the legal. It's called, I, the kids call it ghosting. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Or at least that's what I've been told. <laughs> yeah, so divorce via ghosting. Not legally sanctioned, but how are you going to prove well, it? Well, he's got a trail of women now behind he's him. He's got two. So they begin a courting, you know, walking hand in hand in the street, going on little dates. Mm-hmm. And Ruxton goes back to England in 1928, but Isabella comes with him. So they're, they're a real thing. And he worked as a locum to a local doctor who is a fellow Parsi doctor. Menkek Mofram, and then would later become an assistant to Dr. B.R. Brian Gates. So you see him working within his community a little bit, getting experience, getting building up his practice. On top of it, the following year, following year, Isabella gave birth to their first child, a daughter named Elizabeth. So they're not married, but I think they portray the image that they're married because they both are sure. already married. <laughs> Yeah. What is that? Technically, that's polygamy or bigamy. And most places don't allow that. Unless you've ghosted one of your wives, right? No, I think they still then don't you... allow that. <laughs> <There's> got... <laughs> Henry VIII ghosted his first wife pretty hardcore, and the church still said, nah, bro, you're married to her. Oh, man. We dispensated that shit. You... You're still married <laughs> to her. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you, if, if, if I ghost my wife, I guarantee she's coming after me. There's no... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting away with that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's crazy that she didn't make... I'm guessing they really were a bad match. That's the only reason that the arranged marriage didn't stick. Well, that's the... Th- yeah, exactly. Their arranged marriage is a little different, I guess. So there were eventually two more children. Uh, they had another daughter called Diana and a son called Billy. And they lived in number two Dalton Square, Lancaster. And, you know, everybody, it, like, it was perfectly fine. Everyone's happy. He has a busy practice. And then all of a sudden, their neighbors begin to hear violent fighting happening. Oh. So if you don't like hearing discussions of domestic abuse, it's coming. It's not fun at he all. He couldn't have just ghosted her. No, he was not about that. He was much more about um, being a dick. Well, I mean, clearly, as we're going to find out here in a little while, he's seems to be a bit of a sociopath here so a little bit of a control freak and just (laughs) just a hair uh i can't imagine being married to that she's not technically married to him either that's the thing she's not it's not legal they didn't go for the magistrate and say i accept to take this man like woman and all that that never happened they're not married. It's common law, but man and wife, a lot easier to break. So we know on more than one occasion, Isabel actually left him, took the kids with her and took basically ran to her sisters, Mrs. Jean Nelson. And they say it takes an average of seven times for women to leave their So just like it makes sense. And that's often when they're most susceptible when you're leaving to being attacked. Uh-huh. And now, is that a modern statistic? Because it could have been far worse then. Yeah, that's a modern statistic. I, w- I would guess. Yeah. It's, I think it's it's the average too. So some people it's once and some people it's like 20. Right. Yeah. The worst one took place in 1934 when she walked out, threatened to never return, but her sister convinced her to come back. Because remember, she's a woman with kids. And what do they not like at this point? Single moms. Oh, you got a husband. Yeah. Go back to your husband. Your husband can support you. Uh, yeah. Who's going to take care of you? But on top of this, there's a uh, talks of infidelity, like I said, abuse, hysteria, all of that. And Buck is actually really highly esteemed in the Lancaster community. So that's his Lancaster, if you guys don't know, in the UK, it's kind of, it's on the, it's on the West Coast by the Lake District. It's, um, I'm trying to think of, the UK is shaped, it's where it starts to skinny. Let's put it that way. It's where the island starts to skinny on the West Coast, north of Manchester, if you know where that is, closer to the Scottish border and all of that fun stuff. Pretty much anytime they would fight Isabella and like got really bad, Isabella would pack up and go to Edinburgh 
And Ruxton would call her because telephones are a thing, guys. And basically plead with her to come back. He's like, come back to Lancaster. Like, return to me, return to me. And he would tell the cops in investigations that when she would turn, return, she would say, quote, I wonder how I could ever pick up an argument with, with you, end quote. So basically, I don't know how I could argue with you. I was like, well, at this point, he's telling them later on. So I'm like, mm, this is skeevy. I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to remember, he's wor- his medical practice and his home are at the same address starting in 1930. So he bought a house. He's got his office. So he can really keep an eye on her. Yeah, he's total controlling everything at this mm-hmm. point. He accuses her of adultery. And that's why he, he says he assaults her. And this is why their neighbors call the police for interventions. And often they had to be settled at the police station. The police recorded that Ruxton would begin just talking erratically and then burst into tears. This Hmm. got so bad that in 1932, Isabella attempted suicide by inert gas asphyxiation while pregnant. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what inert gas asphyxiation was because science and it is a form of asphyxiation from breathing in an inert gas, which basically it doesn't have enough oxygen. There's not oxygen involved. So you basically are depriving your body of oxygen through breathing in gas rather than, which is, I mean, how bad is it that you're doing that? Well, no kidding. I mean, she's already tried to leave. Clearly, she feels trapped. Mm -hmm. And so this actually resulted in a miscarriage on top of it. So that's another source of shame on her. And like, he probably starts blaming her. So it's it's building up. She complained in 1933 that her husband had begun to beat her. And then the police arrive at the practice to investigate the claim. Ruxton goes, I never assaulted my wife. She really had just been unfaithful to me. So she's making it up. Oh, man. Now, is this the same guy that was crying, putting on Mm -hmm. tears a little while ago? Unreal. Within 24 hours of that, she was back with him because she she doesn't know anyone there. She'd have to go all the way back to Edinburgh. And her sister keeps talking him back. So in April Mm -hmm. 1934, the police are called again following another fight. The Ruxton said, Quote, Sergeant, I feel like murdering two persons. My wife is going out to meet a man, end quote. So he's just laying it on. Maybe she's trying man. to get a way out, uh-huh. I thought. Do you think, so do you think he's he's stri- he's paranoid as well? I mean, is this a guy that clearly he doesn't see reality already, the way reality is? Is he making things up about his wife? We really don't know. And I, my question is, we I don't really so. know what happened with him and his arranged marriage. What if she cheated on him? And he just gets, you know, you see a lot of these killers, they get so paranoid because someone else did it. Yeah. So maybe that's why his father-in-law was willing to send him the modern day equivalent of 9,000 pounds. Oh, yeah. To try and avoid some kind of shame in his family mm-hmm. or something of that nature. So his daughter's still technically yeah. married. That's an interesting theory. Yeah. 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 So we move from April... 1934 to a year later, September 1935, she goes to Edinburgh to visit one of her sisters. And she, on this trip, she's accompanied by a prominent Lancaster family named Edmondson. And they're really closely related. Because Ruxton couldn't come with him, he had to stay back. And so it's like, interesting. And he would later tell investigators that he had been convinced that Isabella had been known to occasionally keep social company, <laughs> aka fuck. That's what it means. Read between the lines, social company, with a young man named Robert Edmondson, an assist- who was an assistant editor in the local town hall. Basically admits that she had been conducting an affair with him and used that trip to go to Edinburgh, probably to see her family, to continue their affair. Oh, no, 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 back up, back up now. She was doing this again? That's what... Or he thought, we're still, we're still, we don't even really know, right? This is his side of the story. We don't have hers. Yeah, okay. There was hotel records that they had each booked into booked into separate rooms while they stayed in Edinburgh. So like, they're in the same hotel. It, it could have been an affair. Yeah. They could have also just traveled together because it was seen more socially acceptable. Yeah. You know, yeah, you should, uh, to have a man with you, right? You got to travel with the man. How else will you get on and off the trains? They're so confusing. <laughs> they, I mean, at this point, they finally realized that if women were on trains, their uteruses wouldn't fly out. That's my favorite. <laughs> they, they're like, women can't ride on trains. Their, their parts will fly out. It's like, that's not how human bodies work. Oh, my gosh. I, th- I think it's the boys' body parts that are oh, more, yeah, yeah, it's just like, <laughs> more susceptible it'll upset to exposure. or something in your womb. Your womb will get up too excited. Like, yeah. <laughs> I try not to judge them. They didn't know. But so sh- a few months after this, Isabella would be dead, as well as their 19-year-old Mokarebe maid, who was named Mary Jane Rogerson. So the wife and the maid are dead in a couple months. So where was she when she died? Good question. Oh, we don't know. It's a mystery. This is one of the, like, this case is really popular in forensic books. 
because a lot of early forensics. Where did, did, did they find her body? Is that, oh, we're getting there. All right. All right. I'm excited. So Mary Jane had actually worked for the Ruxtons as a maid for three years. So it's, she's not a new maid. It's not like she knows the family. It's really, so I, I love this quote. Uh, from one of my sources, how these women met their two women met their death is still one of the most fascinating in the history of crime today. And no one talks. About huh. it. So and it is it's going to get gross. It's going to get real gross. And the public right, loved it. Oh, we, we got newspapers spinning everywhere. huh? Oh, yeah. So the best part about this is people always go, oh, this true crime fat. Y'all, we've been obsessed with true crime forever. Please stop getting no kidding. Oh, you know, I'm obsessed with murder ballads. Oh, Brittany. I love a good murder ballad. I am upset. I love murder ballads. I think they're the most fascinating thing. And I mean, that's that's what that was. That was Scottish tabloids. I think I have one. Wait, wait, scrolling, scrolling to the end. I got one for you at the end. Wait, does Buck have his own murder ballad? A little bit, yeah. Or at oh, least a poem. Oh. Okay. You're going to make me wait. Oh, yeah, it's at the you? very end. So we're going to end with it. I had to scroll. Uh, so we begin our murder story with two women taking a morning stroll along the road between Carlisle and Edinburgh at a place called the Devil's Beef Tub. I love the UK ter- like places. <laughs> Devil's Beef Tub? This is two miles from Moffat. And so currently, if you'd like to travel there by car from Lancaster, it takes about two hours. It's about 113 miles because I Google map that shit, guys. It is also gorgeous. So the Devil's Bath Tub is a beautiful hilly location beef tub sorry not bathtub beef tub it's a it's a beautiful hilly like ravini area it's seriously google it it's gorgeous and it's fun to it's probably good walking past it around there and all that as anyone who's watched a good jane austen movie knows they love to walk go for a walk in the countryside <laughs> so they looked they're walking over a bridge they look down and are like, hey, that's a human arm in that stream. Oh, dear. So this is what happens. This is how the bodies are discovered. They discover an arm yeah. under a bridge. Uh, quickly after that, they found more remains. And this is pretty much the largest thing that happened in Moffat. So they were like, the local police were like, uh-uh. So they call him the top Scottish expert. So this is a small town where this is happening? Yeah. Moffat is off the A7, and it looks like just a village. It's not very large. Uh-huh. So this really was something that mm-hmm. was immense. It wasn't like finding a random arm in London and it kind of being on the bottom of the newspaper. It's like it's a Tuesday day. and there's an yeah, arm. Yeah. Yeah. So they call in the top experts, but the remains are so badly dis- like discombobulated and everything. They're like, um, we don't know how many bodies this is. Oh my gosh. So can you, do you know what, when you say discombobulated, like in pieces? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, like. So the whole torso of one of the bodies is gone. You don't know. Oh. Well. Um, on each, the eyes, the ears, the nose had been removed and the hands had been lacerated. So cut a bunch. Shoot. So they have no eyes, ears or noses, wow. you know, and so they're like, they're, they pull out their mind hunter handbook and they go mm, skills because it's kind of hard to take out eyes. I've been informed it's not that hard to take off an ear. And <laughs> the chef at the restaurant is an ex-Marine. Okay, it's come up a couple of times. <laughs> but clearly, I, well, I mean, clearly it's it's like finding Jack the Ripper, right? You see the victims and you're like, hey, this guy kind of knew what he was doing. He knows doing. where Bits and Bobs go. Yeah. On top of it. Wait, w- Bits and Bobs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Bits and Bobs of you. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> There's also very little blood. So they figured out that the bodies had been drained. So we see this like kind of starting to figure out forensically little psychology. So the uh-huh. first thing is on their list is has some anatomical knowledge. So we're looking for someone with that. And they discovered one mistake that the guy made when he, you know, he kind of made them unrecognizable. He took a torso uh-huh. for some reason, or maybe it washed further down the stream. We don't know. He wrapped some of the remains in a newspaper. That's not a great idea. Oh, man. Come on. He obviously has not been watching true TV. He's never seen ID. Any, never seen ID now. Yeah. He obviously hasn't, hasn't <laughs> learned from it. So And doesn't listen to podcasts. So I listen to podcasts, guys. <laughs> Again, I'm going to do my mini disclaimer. Do not murder. This just has to come up occasionally. Do not murder. It's not a good thing. So what newspaper might you ask it's wrapped up in well it's a special edition of the sunday graphic which is only in two areas the lancaster or macambra area which i'm gonna guess that's britain and so i'm probably not pronouncing that right so british (laughs) 
And, you know, they were like, okay. They begin carrying out the works. They get Professor John Glaser and his assistant, Dr. Martin of Glasgow University, and Professor James Brash of Edinburgh University. So he's like, they're like, come and please help us. So they're basically going to help establish the forensics on this. And they pretty quickly discover the remains and that there were two, a disappearance of two women from Lancaster. They're like, we have two bodies. We got two missing women. Uh, two by- <laughs> if we- I need to eat that, by the way, guys. You can't see it. Podcasting's not a visual medium. I just was like. I think, can you say the nickname now or are you going to build up to the nickname? Because, I mean, that really is a pretty. Isn't it bl- just Bloody pretty, Ruxton? I thought I saw one like this was Jigsaw Murders. Oh, let me. Oh, yeah. Me well, okay. The Wikipedia, you know, I mean, I'd like to go deeper than the Wikipedia, but they call it, uh, yeah, these murders are informally known as the bodies under the bridge and the Jigsaw Murders. Oh, I might have to. Oh, yep. I just, yeah. And he became known as the Savage Surgeon. Savage it Surgeon. It sounds like I have a lisp at that point. Um, I can't say it. <laughs> savage Surgeon. I can't. I can't do it. Well, <laughs> I can't do it. He doesn't deserve it to be used correctly anyway. Oh, yeah. He's an asshole of history. <laughs> you guys missed. I do my own gra- fake graphics like I'm on YouTube. Um, so the officers go up to Bucks and they're like, hey, but where are these women? And he goes, oh, you know, they're on holiday in Scotland. And the police were like, hmm, I'm going to say, how about no? And basically just watched his house. They put his house, like, not even, like, trying to hide it. They're all just chilling there with their their mugs of tea that people bring out to them. I'm guessing the neighbors do. Is this, is this like, Scotland Yard? Is that the, in, the, in their hats? I'm, I'm picturing. The I mean, Bobbies, yes. You know. There's Bobbies outside. Of, the Bobbies, that's the, bobbies. the word. I'm going to get their tea. <laughs> Shaking little sips. Watching him. They then proceed to collect all of the drip from all the drains and the debris under number two Dalton Square. And they're like, well, we're going to go CSI this shit and lay them out and examine them. They found. That's really impressive for this time frame to be doing that much forensics. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a little early for that. I mean, you're not there's no profiling yet. I mean, clearly there's not genetic. Do they even know what blood type is yet at that point? I don't. I don't know enough about that kind of. Yeah, I don't know enough about that. I know like we're starting to get actually like the Metropolitan Police are a thing. So police forces are a thing now. And they do have like mm-hmm. detectives and all of that looking into this. So there's our people yeah, specializing. Certainly. It's getting better, but it's still very early on. Right. You know, gloves. Yeah, you don't need to wear them in this case, probably when they're touching, they're touching everything. They're not quite there. Yeah. 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 They're like the, what is it? Those eighties and nineties cases where you see them not wearing gloves and like touching everything and like smoking on the crime scene like that level. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so they discover a photo of Isabella wearing a tiara, which yes, they measured the tiara cause they found it to calculate how far the, like the camera was from her and like how, like to basically figure out her skull size. So they're going oh, to, wow. Use a photograph to measure a skull, which people still do this to like figure out like measuring stuff like that. And they took a then took a picture of the skull, the same difference, and they pretty much perfectly lined up. Wow. Then they examined dental records. Yeah, bitches, we're doing it. (laughs) (laughs) So they, I mean, they kind of matched the dental records. They had two heads, two upper bodies, and shoulder blades. Um, Seventeen limb portions. Seventeen between two, two women. women. Seventeen limb bits and forty-three pieces of soft tissue. Oh, that's so creepy! Just the word "soft <laughs> tissue," much less thinking of like, oh man, so these women were truly butchered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it took it had to take so much time. That's the thing to do it. So much time. Like this is this might be a crime of passion, but it's not in the moment. This man clearly so, spent a bit of time. Yeah. Doing the murder might have been in the top like a crime of passion but afterwards sure. he covered that shit up as best he could yeah, yeah. but since they had been drained of blood it meant that some of the pieces had to be identified under microscope so mm-hmm. they were like eh. wow yeah so conveniently the chief constable of lancaster so aka chief cop was Mr. H. Fan, and it became very convenient for him because his office was at the town hall across the street from the Ruxton house. <sighs> so he could literally open his window. I'm assuming, again, mug of tea, sipping uh-huh. it, staring. Got a got a Man. telescope, just watching. Now you said you said Buck here. He was, I mean, he was kind of prominent in that community. He was right? a prominent local doctor. Yeah, so it's probably a street of rich people, and, and yeah, they, which probably made it even bigger of a deal. Uh, like rich people are upper middle class. Yeah. And, you know, at this point, we're 
we're starting into World War II. Again, I avoid this period. I avoid World War II like the plague. I Wait, love- where, where are we at? We're like 1935 yeah. or so, somewhere around there? Okay, yeah, yeah. So for the U.S., World War II is not that big of a deal. For Europe, it's starting to become a very, very big deal. And, you know, let's just go with the descriptions of the murder and the level of which we know has been put together through the science of the time. So on September 14th, 1935, Isabella left her family home to view the black cool illuminations, black cool lights, and visit her two sister, one, two of her sisters who both live near black cool. Black cool still does this, I believe. So it's basically a big light show. She left and... If you look at Lancaster, Black yeah, Hills, it's a little yeah, south. south and east. It's right along the coast. It's mm-hmm. known for its famous boardwalk. It has it's like a Coney Island feel. Like there's games and amusements and all of that. So oh, it, you're not going to bring clowns into this story, too, are you? It's not going to get that disgusting. No, no, That's freaky. I don't like I don't like clowns. <laughs> they're creepy. Just yeah, just sociopaths. Just sociopaths. No clowns. I can deal with sociopaths, not clowns, because those are people oh. who choose to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so she returns around 11:30 p.m. So almost midnight, and it's like a it's a easy kind of day trip kind of thing. You take the train and all that. It's not crazy. And really, we see her her arrival home basically on Sunday, September 15th. Ruxton so jealous and paranoid, straight like they assume he strangled her into submissiveness or like at least unconsciousness. Because as we all know, strangulation very difficult bare hand wise. It takes most likely about seven plus minutes to do it because you have to consistent pressure and all of that. Then he beat her and stabbed her body. So even if she wasn't dead by the strangulation, she then was beaten and stabbed a bunch yeah so not great guy there was rage and emotion attached to this this was not just cold sociop- socio sociopathy is that the word cold this guy was, pissed. <laughs> he was it's a crime of passion this is why like i'm thinking something happened with his actual wife because the uh, reason why he was so jealous and paranoid as soon as they moved there like either she Something she did cheat on, Isabella did cheat on him, or he already had that tendency in him from some. Yeah, well, you should, uh, you know, re- being reading so many of these true crime stories, and especially the older ones, it's it's interesting because you you don't know, you know, we we don't live in the context of those worlds right now, and don't, and even though we can kind of have an intellectual understanding of these worlds, like what really was going on that kids were learning and kids were dealing with that would make them more susceptible prone to this yeah or susceptible is a good word to this than um than the way you know children are raised now and i i don't know i because it seems to me that like well you know let's say your wife cheated on you and you know you get mad and obviously there's a lot of stuff well a typical person is gonna not kill their wife they're gonna leave and i guess he left but then he killed the second wife so I, you or- know there had to be something more going on with this man to make him so brutal. Or it could be mommy you issues. Know, Maybe mommy cheated on daddy. Mom is, well, mommy's always the mommy issues are always the cause, right? According to Criminal Minds, pretty much, yeah. Criminal Minds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm on season eight, guys. Uh, I'm working my way through. If this quarantine goes any uh, longer, I'm going to catch up. And that's we don't need that. <laughs> so they don't know how the housemaid got involved. Either that he might have just she might discover his crime, like walk downstairs uh-huh. and be like, oh, shit. The lady of the house is hella dead. Well, how the hell do you not know if you're there? And what did you say? So he strangled her? He strangled her? her, then beat her, and then stabbed her. You're going to hear some. Yeah. But, I mean, at that point, servants' quarters are all the way up in the attic. So okay. first yeah. floor, maybe not. Or because she had been downstairs and witnessed it. Ruxton then bludgeoned her, the maid, Mary, extensively. So that's not great. When they use the word extensively, yeah. you're just like, ooh, that's not the term. Yes, yeah, something that's already brutal to begin with. Yeah. And then most likely either strangled or asphyxiated her. And then again, stabbed either before or after death. There was stabbing, asphyxiation, and bludgeoning involved in both of them. Mm -hmm. Not great. They found blood. Let's put this. A shit ton of blood on the stairs, walls, carpeting in their household. And the flow of blood prior to the mutilation. And that's where they get the idea that he stabbed both victims either before or after, like just after the death or Mm -hmm. the cause of the murder was the stabbing. Because the bodies, when they were found, they weren't in the best shape. So they could tell, like, what had been done, but not what order it had been done in. On the day prior to the murders, Buck informed one of the chairwomen that he and Liz- Isabella uh, employed not to come to premises. Uh, he informed one of their, like, friends that, like, oh, don't come to the premises. Like, we'll come, you know. He's he- These are their employees. Basically goes to their employees and says, oh, don't come to our house. Like, We'll be okay. Well, we just don't come until Monday and you don't need to come and clean or anything because Isabella and Mary Jane are gone. 
they went on a trip. That's a little weird because he talked to one the day before the murders and then hours after the murder, he goes to the home of the other one and tells them not to come in either, like the cleaners. He goes to the cleaners and is like, don't come clean our house. So this is, is that evidence? It was premeditated? I think the fact that he came the day prior to the murder. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. So this is premeditated. Well, he's just in such a psychotic episode that it, it yeah. all makes sense to him, but everybody else is like, what the hell are you doing? So then he takes his children, because yeah, the kids were in the house too, guys. It couldn't make it any worse. Oh, dear. To the home of uh, more Cambre Dennis, which whom the family had a close friendship. And he's like, hey, can you look after the kids for the day? Isabella's out of town. Like, I got to get some stuff done and I just need someone to watch the kids. Which, I mean, who's going to say no? Like, oh, uh-huh. yeah, sure. I'll watch your kids. He returns to the home. You don't have kids, no. do you? Yeah. Feels like everyone says no. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wanna, wants to babysit the Shex Snyder children, my email is... <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, like, if, if it was like a mutual thing where you both like, it seems like they both probably took turns taking care of the kids and stuff. So it's a normal, yeah, it was sure. not an uncommon right, thing. Right, right, right. And if probably if they had kids, it was like, yeah, what's umpteen more? Well, three more to just run around and create chaos. And then he spent the rest of the day dismembering, mutilating in the, in the bathroom of their home. You know, the most likely place to mutilate people is in your bathroom. I don't know. I guess drainage situation is the well, best. It doesn't have carpet. That's it's true. easy to clean. And if you put them in the tub. I mean, I, I never would have thought of it being so popular even at that time frame because when I think of, you know, mob hits or something from mob movies, everybody putting people in the bathtub, you know, the cleaners, right? But yeah. Well, think about it. Like it's, pro- it's porcelain tubs most likely this time. So, and they were upper, they were better class. So they probably had drain it, like public drain it or actual actual like, drainage, plumbing, yeah. So Yeah. And then he worked to hide their identity several hours later, around 4.30 PM. So, you know, it's a busy day for him. He murdered two people at the beginning of the day, told his other cleaner to not come in till the 16th. So basically skipping a day, um, dropped his kids off and then dismembered the bodies. He, at 4.30, he visits the home of one of his patients, Mrs. Hampshire, asked for her and her husband to return to Dalton Square to help him, quote unquote, prepare for the decorators, end quote. Prepare for the decorators. To- That's, that sounds like Al Capone stuff. Well, apparently they had, he's like, oh, it's been, they're coming tomorrow. They're going to do work we'd arranged this months before. Uh-huh. So Mrs. Hampshire arrives and she then testifies at the trial that all the carpeting has been removed from the stairs. Several sections of the flooring was littered with straw, weird, and the straw protrudes from it underneath the stub door of a locked bedroom. Not suspicious at a all. A locked bedroom. With hay, co- like straw coming out of the bottom. Like that's where it's all coming out of. I'm like, that's when I slowly back away and then go, thank you very much and a good day. The waiting room of the property. So remember, this is also his office. She found several rolled up sections of carpeting, stair pads, and a stained suit. Stained How is that suit. not suspicious? We're not leading up to him getting away with this, right? I know the answer. <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm just, in my head, I'm also just singing from uh, Parks and Rec. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Don't oh, gosh, be suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> don't be suspicious. That's just what the whole thing is. I'm like, it's so suspicious, which is why this fits. In the garden, what would we find but another two sections of carpeting? And several burned towels, because, you know, when in doubt, burn that shit. So before they left, they were given several sections of the stained carpeting, his stained suit to keep so they could clean them. Wow. Yeah. Like, what? That's no shame. I mean, that's no fear. That's no fear whatsoever. That's that's powerful man confidence, guys. (laughs) We know, we're pretty sure he had taken the remains to Scotland the night of the 19th. So murdered them the 15th. We think he transported the body the 19th. And jumped him into the ravine. Wow. And then when were they discovered? What was the date? Was it the 25th? Is that what you said? 29th of September. A young woman named Bubba. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, it looks like they found him on the 29th. Yeah. So, like, so that's what, yeah, 10, days? 10 days after? So, I mean, they had, it took some time for them to find him so they could decay out. And they'd been, at that point, dead for 15, yeah, almost two weeks. So, I mean, granted, it is September, so it's colder, so decomposition slows down, but I don't know the weather at the time, so there's a lot of things. He was observed loading parcels into his car earlier that day. On the 17th, coming back, he had knocked a cyclist off his bicycle in Kendall at uh, 12.35 p.m., so like he hit a a, a cyclist, rude. (laughs) Cyclist was like, fuck you, writes down his registration number, 
reports the hit and run to the police. So a man who didn't want to be tracked there, like, you think, bum, bum, bum. don't hit a dude if you're trying to be unsuspicious. Like, come on. And so the Kendall police contacted Minthorpe police, who would then put up a roadblock at Minthorpe. They stopped Ruxton, questioned him, got his driver license insurance, well, basically was told to produce them to the Lancaster police, because I guess he didn't have them. And they were like, he seemed a little agitated, and he had a small child in the car with him, which... What the fuck? No kidding. He brought one of the kids along. They he's got a- mom in the trunk. Yeah, he's got mom and the maid in the trunk and the baby in the back seat. Well, we knew he didn't have good judgment before no. this. But what did he tell the police? He's like, "Oh, I'm returning from a business trip to Carlisle." But really, people are like, "Was it a business trip, or was he looking for somewhere to dispose the bodies?" Because he probably wouldn't dispose of this like dirt, middle of the day. Thing and probably driving around looking for a good spot, like taking those back roads. Yeah, somewhere to come back mm-hmm. to tonight. In a couple days, plot it, figure out a good time. We know on the 10th of October at 3.50 a.m., yes, in the morning, trains were running that early, guys. He was met at the Lancaster Ra- Railway Station by Inspector Clark, you know, the one who had an uh, office across from his house and could sit there and drink his tea, like, all menacing, I guess, <laughs> like a cool a cool cop movie. They just the silhouette in his house, drink a tea. Yeah, <laughs> I'm watching you. I see you. I see you. And he was like, so, Mr. Ruxton, Dr. Ruxton, you said your wife is in Edinburgh. Been there. She's not there. Which, dun, dun, which if you dun, think about it, it's a, such a big city. How do you know? But yeah. he probably went and talked to everybody who knew her in Edinburgh and had Edinburgh police help her. Yeah. Ruxton said he had been up to Edinburgh to look for his wife. So he's like, I was looking for my wife. That's why I'm at the railway station. That's why I'm here. I was looking for her. I can't find her. And and, that was his excuse? Yeah. But he just told them he knew that she was gone, that she was off on like yeah, vacation. Yeah, he said he went right? to go find her on vacation. He couldn't find he her. He find her. She's not on yeah. vacation. How weird. Oh, dear. He also then tells the inspector, you know, I, I, I hit a guy in Kendall, but I haven't been up that, like that way up north and said he had gone to Seattle and returned via Seattle and returned via Kendall, which were, how is, oh, okay. There's a couple places named Seattle kind of thing in the UK. I don't know where it is, but it's interesting. He basically had been to another area in the UK and returned via Kendall. So he went, he basically went somewhere close to there, but that's why he was there. Not because he was definitely looking for somewhere to dispose of a body. Yeah. I'm not seeing Kendall on this, which is Kendall UK. Oh, which Kendall's like a medium, looks like a, a decent sized town and stuff. There's a decent amount and not too far from Lancaster, but you're definitely going north if you're going that way. It's like, uh-huh. I'm definitely not going north the way those bodies were found. <laughs> and when he was returning, and then they're like, okay, well, you said you were returning from Carlisle, so you weren't going that way. And oh, I guess it's Seattle. Um, And then, so there's going to be a whole issue about that stuff and why he was there and whatnot. And for, for a doctor, this guy ain't really that smart. No, either. no. But I mean, everybody oh. thinks they're smart until they have to try to get away with murder. Oh, think yeah. about it. People think they're very smart and you could be very smart, but it's really hard to get away with murder. Is it, it's the Dunning-Kruger where you think you're smarter than you are? Yeah, probably. What is it? Or dumb people think they're smarter and smart people think they're dumb? It makes sense. Isn't that the, the deal? Um, so at that time, Mary Rogerson's mother is looking where her daughter went and she's like, she's, she's like, Ruxton, where's my daughter? She works for you. She hasn't shown up. She hasn't written. She hasn't called. And he's like, and he basically told her she, her daughter was pregnant and had been sent away to have the baby. Not uncommon, but uh-huh. her mom's like, uh, fuck you, and goes and reports her daughter missing at the police station. Oh, dear. And on top of it, Isabella is also reported missing by her family. Not by Rexton. Again, remember, the joke where it's always the husband. Yeah. When the husband doesn't report his wife missing, it's very suspicious. Yeah. And... But they like accepted it because originally, because Rexton is a doctor. So they're like, he can't lie to us. He's a doctor. Well, that's what I was saying. He clearly lives in the part of town where the, the upper middle class live and the, the more high society or folks he's are. Fancy. Right? He's got pinky out and everything. <laughs> and because Rexton's story was again that she ran off with her new boyfriend. So the uh-huh. trial. He's changed this story several times now, yeah. right? So first it was she's off on vacation, she's off with a new boyfriend. She's having a kid She's helping elsewhere. the maid have a kid or something. Yeah, like it, it's not great. Or even like that the maid went off not to much have a consistency. kid and the mom's like, I know my daughter. That's not happening. So we have a ton of people who are, are remaining loyal to Buck Ruxton and they still go to the surgery. So he's still doctoring, guys. He's still practicing wow. medicine. Uh, the police are trying to get appeals for help. They're like anyone who's seen a stone color car in the Millthorpe area and that's how they ended up finding out that he had knocked a man off his bike because he 
knew he had a stone colored Austin 12 saloon, which I'm, it, it's a car. <laughs> I'm not good uh. at that. And that's when they start making a timeline of his events. I love it's British. So it's, it says he made a timetable and figuring out his movements several days before and after the alleged murder on September 5th. And they're like, okay, this is hella suspicious. They finally arrest him two days after a continuous investigation. He was charged in the early morning of October 13th, and it's a month and a day after Mary Rogerson's father had last seen her alive. So it took him about a little over a month to be like, we found him. He's right here. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Those poor parents. Yeah. So they didn't, charge him with murder of his wife until November 5th. So remember, remember the 5th of November. They put together the remains of the body and they couldn't really tell them apart. So they called them one and two. One ended up being Mary and two ended up being Isabel. So I think they just kind of try to put them together and then figure out who is who. Oh man, that's That's so creepy. And then they opened the trial March 2nd, 1936. So you have Norman Brickett for the defense and Jackson, Maxwell, Fry, and Hartley Shawcross for prosecution. So you have three prosecutions. We have the judge, Justice, Mr. Justice, John Singleton, and everybody is pretty experienced. They're pretty good lawyers. You have 115 witnesses for the prosecution, 209 crown exhibits, and this is being held in the Manchester Assizes, so Manchester courts. It took the prosecution four hours to make their opening statement. (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh. They had so much on him, clearly. Yeah. Uh, what was it? A hundred and how many witnesses? 115 witnesses. Just for the prosecution. 115. Yeah. Wow. It would last 11 days. Wow. One of the star witnesses was the sister, Jeannie Nelson. And this was considered the biggest murder trial of the century. So when it opened, he was tried um, and he entered a formal plea of not guilty to the charge of murder. And they get the, you know, we start the processes. The prosecution's case is that Ruxton was inflamed by jealousy, paranoia, murdered Isabella and Mary Jane, the family household, then discarded their bodies more than a hundred miles from Lancaster in the garden home in stream of in southern uplands of Scotland. So they were like clearly he was having issues, like this is why it was. Yeah. Yeah, they, they had no problem finding a motive on no. this guy. So we're gonna get a Quote from uh, the lead prosecutor, Joseph Cooksley Jackson, quote, it does not need much imagination to suggest what probably happened in that house. It is very probable that Mary Jane was a witness to the murder of Mrs. Ruxton, and that w- that is why she met her death. You will hear that Mr. Ruxton had received her before had received before her death violent blows in the face and that she was strangled. The suggestion of the prosecution is that her death and that of the girl Mary took place outside these rooms on the landing on t- at the top of the staircase outside the maid's bedroom because from that point down the staircase right into the bathroom where there are trails of enormous quantities of blood. I suggest that when she went up to bed, a violent quarrel took place. He strangled his wife and that Mary Rogerson caught him in the act and had to die also. Mary's skull was fractured. She had some blows on top of her head that would render her unconscious and then was killed by some other means, probably a knife, end quote. That's opening, guys. That's just how we started the <laughs> yeah. trial. And it still lasted 11 days. You gotta, I mean, you got 110 witnesses and 200 like pieces of evidence. That's going to take a minute. <laughs> uh, well, there's no, I mean, no reasonable doubt there. His defense, uh, Brickett and assisted by Philip Kershaw, Casey, they, their defense was based that the bodies had been misidentified. The two bodies were not those of Mary Ruxton and or Isabel Ruxton and Mary Jane Rogerson, but two unknown individuals. And that the evidence presented was flawed. Because remember, forensics is new. Yeah. So, so their entire defense is that these people aren't even dead. Yeah, and, and if they are, we don't have the bodies, so you can't charge Those aren't this those guy. bodies, and we don't know. Yeah. So they contended that the bloodstains were found upon the carpet in the suit from from him being yeah, a doctor like, or something it's, oh, it's from years of the practice that's what it, you know sure. i keep my suits bloody after i practice my doctoring until it's <laughs> really bloody and then i, I have someone i was gonna it. say if you're going for a checkup hell right now you know if you're gonna go for a checkup and you walk in and there's your doctor and on oh, there's just freaking blood splattered on there i don't know guys run away uh, run away i don't know I don't know. Yeah. Um, they would call like witnesses to present their findings to the court, like so all the uh, scientific cops, all of that, and the prosecution would just be very diligent. The defense is trying to get any discrepancies out to kind of like put some doubt and challenging 
any medical or technical witnesses whenever they can. So they're just trying to be like, the science you're using is not science, or it's not good science, I should say. And, or if it was pretty solid, they're like, well, could this, like basically put planting doubt, such as uh, Brickett contended the blood found on the balustrade of number two Dalton Square might've accidentally spilled there either through a birth, an abortion, or a women's menstrual cycle occurring on the property. So on a balustrade, if you don't know, blame it on the women. The spindles on a staircase. I'm sorry, no woman menstruating is going to accidentally get that on a stair, like, railing. I appreciate that tidbit of knowledge you've just given me. (laughs) Also, like, who's, uh, what are you doing in your household that there's births or abortions on your staircase? (laughs) Are they just aiming it at, like, pushing the baby out towards the staircase? Like, what is happening? And think about it. It was an owl. It was an owl, guys. It was (laughs) It was an owl. <laughs> so what the title is now, The Jigsaw Murders. It wasn't an owl. Um, oh. You know, basically, they did occasionally get a witness to agree to the alternative version. They did have Ruxton testify on his own behalf on the ninth day of the trial. Not the best idea. Uh-huh. You mean the man who changed his uh, his his, mm-hmm. his uh, alibi 20,000 times? He did not do well. Got up and talked. Well. He was prone to bouts of hysterical sobbing. He clutched a silk handkerchief, claiming hysterically he had last seen his wife when she had taken Mary Rogerson to Edinburgh to discreetly arrange for an abortion for her. So we changed again. Um, (sighs) You know, he's like, I I did fight. I did argue with my wife because she was like not faithful. Wait, can we back up here? Wasn't he a gynecologist? Like a man? Okay. Because, you know, he couldn't have done that abortion either. And let's remind you guys. These abortions weren't the best, so you could still die and bleed yeah, out. This like, was a, it not great. Yeah, the, this was a pretty difficult time for medicine. It was a difficult. They knew enough to get them in yeah. trouble, and not enough to save them. If I remember correctly, um, I was trying. I don't remember if it was when it was. I think it it might have not even been legal because Northern Ireland is still. Yeah, it was. It was kind of iffy if it was legal or not. So, guys, it's great. Oh, no, it was actually um, the criminality of abortion was redoubled in 1929 when the Infant Life Preservation Act of 1929 was passed. So basically, it was to close, I think, a loophole in the law, which allowed infants to be killed during birth. Gross, wrong. But this pretty much, if you were over 28 weeks, you are you couldn't have an abortion. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, so he's used this as an yeah, alibi. So he's used the abortion. They're going to get a secret abortion. Sir, you know what's more secret if you just did it in the house? I'm not saying it's a great idea. But there's, there's clearly enough uh, issues in that so house. There's so many issues in this house. He justifies like all this mental and fish- physical hardships because, you know, he loved her so much. That's why they fought yeah. all the time. He was like, oh, my wife's still alive. Like he... Uh, he was really upset the bodies were actually his wife and his maid because his home is broken now. Oh, no. So now he's admitting? He said if, the, if it was the bodies, then his home is in tatters. His happy home. Gotcha. His happy home where your wife keeps leaving yeah. you. Yeah. And he denies all the earlier testimony by the prosecution witnesses. They're lying. They're mistaken. And just rambles. Up, like, he's just a hot mess. And I was like, why did you put him up there? So they close it up and the jury retires to determine what happens now they would deliberate for one hour do you want to know what they came out with oh i know what it is <laughs> if it's only an hour too geez guilty they knew <laughs> of course it is and mr justice singleton sentenced ruxton to death and so he goes do you have anything to say because that's you know he's like ruxton's response was i'm very sorry thank you the Thank you to the court for your patience and fairness for this trial. Like matter of fact like that? Like that matter Politely, of fact, you think? Or, thank you to the court. Polite. Wow. Wow. Yeah. He did appeal and he contended that the justices, the judge's instructions had pretty much predisposed. Biased. Yeah. yeah. And all of that. But, you know, they tried to say it was the forensic evidence in the car. He kept like trying to appeal and like misdirect and say it was no one else. But they... Ha- so the Court of uh, Criminal Appeal was heard by Lord Chief Justice Lord Hardwell, Mr. Justice Dupar, and Mr. Justice Goddard in April 1936. They dismissed it the same day, so not great, as being, quote, insufficient to as to even remotely suggesting, end quote, any form of misdirection on the part of the judge. So they were like, go fuck yourself. Yeah, yeah. go home, murderer. Okay. You're done. And you want to feel gross. There is a there was a petition oh, from Lancaster residents urging clemency for Ruxton 
Do you want to know how many signatures it collected? I'm looking at the number right now. I'll let you do your jazz hands while you say 10, it. 10,000. Unreal. 10,000 people thought he was... Ooh. I mean, that's got to be his standing in that community that's doing that, right? Think I mean, about it. He birthed your kids. He took care of you. He was that trust. That's the one. Yeah, he's part of the family because he's been birthing Taking your care of them, making sure they're healthy. Yeah. And, you know, I get like clemency saying, hey, maybe don't kill him. Leave him in jail forever. But we, they didn't really do that. So he was hung at M, uh, Her Majesty's Prison, Manchester, in May 12th. On May 12, 1936. Well, good. That didn't last long because he had, that was, that was less than a year from the murder, yeah. right? When it's September yeah. 35. So, I mean, man, he, he didn't even get to see another summer, thank God. Yeah, he's a garbage person. So, garbage person. After a little bit, a little song came out specifically at the, uh, to the Red Sails and Sunset, and it was, are you ready for it? Oh, my God. I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to sing, sing it. I can't you sing want me to get, it. You want me to go grab my git fiddle and, and give uh, you a little? Red stains on the carpet. Uh-huh. Red stains on the knife for Mr. Buck or Dr. Buck Ruxton had murdered his wife. The maidservant saw it and threatened to tell. So Dr. Buck Ruxton, he's killed her as well. All right, Courtney, we have to try <laughs> this now. I don't sing. I sing badly. Everyone gotta... has heard it now. Oh, my <laughs> the bath from the house is actually now used as a horse trough at the Hutton Police Headquarters, in case you were wondering. Oh, wow. So probably yeah. could go see and be like, hey, can I go see that murder bathtub? And they'll be like, here, there's a horse drinking water out of the murder bathtub. Unreal. So he was executed. Anything after that? Did he ever confess or anything? No, of course not. No no last words? We don't have famous last words or anything? Yeah, yeah, there was, I mean, there were so many people waiting for him. Like, there's, I'll post pictures on Facebook and stuff of all of it. Like, the the trials and all the documentation. Because they have a lot. I mean, they have pictures of the skull. I know Facebook will let me post some of them. I'll probably, they got mad when I post posted pictures from uh the the russian uh mountaineer accidents the famous uh-huh. one i can't think of and it's a gruesome yeah but it's yeah. interesting because they do have all the pictures are available because they are for like as forensic examples as early forensics wow so it's, yeah so that's what the legacy of this is, is it? i mean this is forensic it's forensic baby case. forensics guys it's baby forensics wow but we'll be back next time with a darker story down in- they're always dark <laughs> You say darker down yeah. in the south? Is that what you're... <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, we do you want to tell them, everyone man. where they can find you? Sure. You can find me on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, your favorite podcatcher, right? Southern Gothic. Or you can visit the website, southerngothicmedia.com. Yep. And it is not as happy as I sound when I say <laughs> that, right? <laughs> so we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. From the earliest British settlements on the shores of Virginia to the treacherous swamps of Louisiana and the isolated mountains of Appalachia. The American South has a rich history filled with eerie legends and mysterious hauntings. Join me, Brandon Schecksneider, as I journey into its underbelly, exploring these tales of loss and heartbreak, tortured souls and spirits of the past, documenting ghost stories and legends amidst rich soundscapes and an eerie original soundtrack that can only be found on my podcast, Southern Gothic. Hey, we're Renee and Adrian, and we are the The Outlandish Historians. Historians. We're sisters, nerds, and lovers of all things history. Except bell bottoms. Keep that in the past. Come hang out with us on the Dear World of History podcast, where we'll frolic through time as we chat and geek out over the good, the bad, and the downright ugly history of the world. We promise you don't have to be a licensed historian to travel through time with us. Maritime disasters? Check. Historical serial killers? Check. Glamorous and petty royals? Check and check. You can find us almost anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter at Dear Historians and Instagram at Outlandish Historians. So chug that drink me bottle and come on down the rabbit hole. It's going to be a wild ride. of domesticity we're available on all podcatchers remember to rate review subscribe to help spread the word or just force other people to listen to it our facebook and twitter are at domestic podcasts and our instagram is at the cult of domesticity we also have podcast merch at threadless 
Uh, as well, if you want to support us financially or show some appreciation, we have a PayPal tip jar and a Patreon, which has some pretty great perks. Any topic suggestions, feel free to email us at domesticpodcast at gmail.com. Remember to stay domestic and cult-free. <laughs>